Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. I am in Boltana. I'm at a campsite called Camping Boltana. It's one of my favorites. It's in northern Spain, sort of in the foothills, nestled in the foothills of the Pyrenees on the Spanish side. If you want the best toilet block, shower block, in northern Spain, Camping Boltana is the site for you. So I've been doing this type of travel on and off for about 30 years. So as I've been spending quite a lot of windscreen staring time in the last few days as I've been tootling around northern Spain, it sort of struck me as the gear that we take with us has now completely transformed to what we had potentially 25, 30 years ago. And if those of you that have been doing this for a while, if you realize the type of gear we had access to 20, 30 years ago, the industry has transformed itself with the type of luxury that we can take away with us. There's innovation absolutely everywhere in all of the different components that we have when we do this type of travel, from things like rooftop tents to ground tents, all of the type of cooking where we have fridges, you name it. We have access to some really cool stuff that make life easier when we do this form of travel. So I wanted to walk through a number of things that I've got that I wanted to share with you that have really transformed the way that I do this form of travel. Now the first one I firmly believe in is when you do this type of travel, whether you're in a rooftop tent, whether you're in a ground tent, in a swag, on a stretcher, you need a good night's sleep. And mattresses are the most important part, in my opinion, of a camping setup. Now this is an X-Bed. This is a deep sleep mat. This is a 5.7 width. This is a medium. And why do I love this? Well, it's the material. It's got this brushed outer sleep surface. And why this is important is if you've had different types of pump-up mattresses, they are made of plastic. They're definitely a plasticky material. You can feel it and they make a noise at night. When you get a sleeping bag material on those plastic sleep mattresses and you turn, you fall off of them. And we've had a number of these now. And when I've been on my own, the worst thing in the middle of the night is when you fall off one of these mattresses and you fall either side of it because you wake up and you're uncomfortable. You have nothing under you. Now these are perfect. These I'm six, just under 6'3". These are just about long enough for me. And I have sort of pillows up at the top and it's comfortable enough. It's also wide enough for me as well. This one is a medium width, but you can get them wider as well. Now, because I have a iCamper Skycam Mini, two of these fit just. Now they fit on the heads, but because this is tapered from this part where your feet is sort of folds over, Getting two of these in, you have to sort of stuff them in the side, but it's fine, they fit. So this material on the outside, you can hear it, stops you sliding around. And when you do turn over in the middle of the night, that most of us do on a side sleeper, you stay on the mat. So on the rear, it is a different color material, but it is different as well. The one on the other side is more brushed. This is a little bit smoother. And I think this allows, and this stays firm on the surface of where you have your sleep surface. I also think it's got a waterproof cover on it as well, that if it does get wet, it doesn't leak into the mattress itself. Now these are quite thick. You can see there's a finger width. My finger. Now these are self-inflating. I don't think it's really important whether it is. It comes with a pump. And I pop the self-inflating plug when I rock up, and it's also got a decompression plug as well. But these are excellent. And after the three or four that we've tried, that have been the plasticky ones, have been noisy, been uncomfortable, been too hard, not firm enough. These ones are perfect. So I'd highly recommend the Expert Deep Sleep Mat. Now the next item I think that has transformed the way that we camp is having a backup power supply. Now some vehicles, have a dual battery system, I do. But some people don't have the car for it, the equipment for it, the budget for it. So this is a Blue Eti. This is an, an EB70. It's 
It's got a thousand watt inverter in it. So it's got two plugs that you can actually, this is AC output, and it's got plenty of inputs as well for USB, USB-C, and it's also got a solar input to it as well. It's sort of got, also got a light on it. The display shows you sort of input, output, and the draw. It's also got the ability to put a phone on the top here and it will charge it wirelessly as well. And then you've got your obligatory 12 volt cigarette plug. Now, why do I take this when I've got a dual battery system? This is really backup for me. By having this, this allows me to charge things independently of my dual battery system in the car. Now, and again, some of you that don't have the space or the budget for a dual battery system should consider having an auxiliary power system. Now, why is that? Well, if you go and put accessories into your vehicle, you go away for the weekend. You might have iPads, phones. You may take a fridge with you as well. And we'll get onto fridges in a minute. If you charge everything off your car battery when it's not running, or you run your fridge overnight, the chances are you're going to wake up in the morning with a dead battery and you will not be able to start your car. So by all means, if you had a fridge, you could plug it into a 12 volt or a USB socket in the car and you can drive and keep the fridge charged up. But when you pull up to wherever you're going to go and you turn the car off, you can unplug your fridge and plug it into the 12 volt and charge your fridge comfortably for a weekend off of one of these uh, power banks. And you can also charge up things like your iPhones, your iPads, all those types of things. And if you needed 24 volt or 220, or if you're in the States, North America, 110, they would provide 110 for you as well. But this should give you enough for at least a weekend of power if you were out in the middle of nowhere and you needed auxiliary power. So I'd highly recommend getting one of these units, regardless of what size it is. This is probably the medium size. You can get smaller ones. You can get much, much bigger ones than these. This one is about, it's about 20 pounds, 15 kilos, somewhere in the region of that. It's quite hefty. But auxiliary power, not your car battery, is vitally important for you, especially if you've got a lot of accessories that need charging up when you go away. Now back to power. If you don't have an auxiliary battery system, second battery, dual battery system, any of that, and you're new to this, I would recommend getting one of these. This is a NOCO. This is a NOCO Boost XL. This is for five liter and up vehicles. Now mine's a 4.4, so this is basically a fail-safe start battery. It comes with plug and two crocodile clips to get your start battery. Now, if you are in a situation where you do drain your start battery, unless you can figure out a way of getting the car started or somebody else is near you to jump you, you're screwed. This is a fail-safe way of getting your car started if you happen to drain it. Now, I have a dual battery system, but I also carry one of these. But I also have this stored away just in case somebody else needs a battery boost. Make sure you get the right one for the vehicle. So this is a 1500 amp. So they come in different sizes, but just make sure you do check it before you go and it's charged up. So you can see mine's charged up with the indicator light, but make sure you keep it on charge. So before you go away, I always keep this in the car. I double check it's charged and it's got a full charge in it. It's got lights in it as well. You can also use it as a power bank. I don't because I have the other power bank, my Blue Yeti. Not just for when you're camping, it's good to have it anyway. So again, all you do, take the plug, plug it into the back, positive, negative, onto your battery, hit the boost button, and it will start your vehicle for you. So this is belt and braces. Get one of these, keep it in your car. You will never have a dead battery again. So the real game changer for me was getting a fridge. Now this is a Dometic, this is a 35 litre fridge. To be honest with you, it's probably one size too big than I really need. If I'm on my own, 25 to 28 litres is probably big enough. Now there are a whole series of fridge makers that do 12 volt, they do conversions to 110 and 240. Now the great thing about having a compressor fridge is that once it gets down to temperature, pretty much stays there and will only kick in as and when you set the temperature. So I've got this set for two degrees. 
which is cool enough. I don't need it anymore. There's a couple of times, once when I had it, where I actually accidentally knocked the temperature down to minus two and it froze everything. So I woke up the next day with frozen milk. I mean, it was slushy and everything, but at the bottom it was frozen. So some of these can freeze. I think Terra Firma have a dual fridge freezer, but that one's quite big. That's a 45, 50 odd liter fridge. So then you need to be worrying about the size of these things. They can get quite big. So this one, it's not too bad as far as the size of it. It fits snugly in and clearly for me, I have built something around housing my fridge. But inside there's enough for beers, drinks, milk, pizzas, I'm quite low at the moment. But inside there is plenty of space. I'm quite low on things because I've been going for about three or four days. I need to go restock up. But what I normally do is I leave all my drinks, milk, pizzas, meat, and then other things at the top here like cheeses and stuff to make it easy to get to. Now a fridge slide is not important as long as you can get access to what's in the fridge. So if you start stacking things on top of the fridge, just know you need to get it all out to get access to your fridge. So bear that in mind of where you put it into your vehicle. Now this is in a permanent housing. It's on a slide, as you can see, it makes it easy to get in and out into the fridge, get what I need, push it back in. So one thing that most modern fridges have today is they have the ability to set a cutoff on voltage. So if you have this wired into your vehicle, you could set the trigger to turn this off when the voltage goes below 12 volts. That way you protect your start battery. But back to what you saw in the previous section, if you have some sort of auxiliary power, you don't need to worry about it. So you could run this off your car battery when you're going to where you're going to go. As soon as you get there, unplug it, plug it into your secondary power source, and then you protect your start battery. Now, those of you that have seen my setup, know that I have a rooftop tent. This is a hard shell. This is the only rooftop tent I've ever owned. Now I've had different types of tents. I've had the relatively cheap Coleman pop-up tent. I've had an ARB swag. But by far, when I was researching the type of sleeping area I wanted with my vehicle, it was obvious to me to get a rooftop tent and get a hard shell. But there are some things you need to consider when you have a setup like this. Now for most times, if I'm doing overnights or doing a wild camp, this won't go up. If I'm stationary for two days, more often than not, I will put this up. It takes about 10 minutes. I've managed to figure out how to get the awning up on my own, 10 minutes, probably max. And all of the eye camper awnings or add-on rooms zip to where the entrance is. So it's quite easy to do. It's just cumbersome and getting the poles up and get everything staked down. So having an awning is also important as well. Now I don't have any other awning on the vehicle. I generally sit at the back of the vehicle underneath the tailgate. Now if you're looking at rocking up somewhere and you need some shade, this is just not going to be practical. So consider some form of awning for shade, especially in warmer climates. If it's raining, getting an awning out and up in a short period of time is vital. Now most of them that go on the sides of the vehicle, I've had them before. It's quite easy to do. You can probably pop one of those awnings with two people in a short period of time. Maybe a minute, maybe two, you'll have the awning up and running and you have shelter. Either shelter from the weather or shelter from the sun. But the reason why I went with this is that I can pop this tent in a minute and I can close it in two. When I want to pack up, I've got a system where I put everything in place where my bedding stays up in my tent and I can close everything down and have this buttoned away in a couple of minutes. If you have a different type of rooftop tent, this is a clamshell, but if you have a rooftop tent that opens different ways and is strapped down with a cover, bear in mind you'll be lucky to get that set up in 15 minutes. And in most cases you're looking at 15 to 20 minutes to take it down. So if you're going place to place, night after night, the time begins to add up. That you could potentially be spending 45 minutes a day opening and packing a rooftop tent. A lot of the rooftop tents 
are not big enough to allow you to have any of your sleeping gear stored up there as well. So bear that in mind. If there are two of you and you have a traditional rooftop tent with a cover, you probably cannot keep mattresses. You probably cannot keep sleeping bags or pillows up in there. So you need to figure out somewhere else to put them. And nine times out of 10, that's gonna be in the back seat or in stuff sacks inside the vehicle. But that's extra setup time. So once you can get your tent up and set up and ready to go, you still need to get everything out of the car, into the tent and ready to go. So that's a major consideration for me by having one of these tents. The clamshell type tent is superior in time and setup than going with any of the other types of tents that fit on the roof of a car. So the time considerations on getting these set up is really important. And as you progress and do more of this type of travel, you'll begin to realize that time is an important aspect of this. So they will pay for themselves in time. Now, the last thing I want to cover is what happens if you get a puncture or what happens if you need to repair a tire when you're out on the trail. So there are a couple of things that I want to share with you that I carry. So I have an ARB tire repair kit. It's always in the vehicle. And there's plenty of things in here that help you repair the flat. So here are all the plugs and everything that you need to be able to repair it. I'd highly recommend getting one of these. Even if you're going away for a weekend, off-roading, get a tire repair kit. This one is a must have. Now that also ties into having a compressor or a means of being able to pump up your tire. So I have an ARB jaw compressor, which is buried. You can probably just about see it in there. It's hidden down here, attached to the side of my frame. It's just where it just sits. This is powered by my secondary battery. And before anybody says anything, yes, there is enough power in my secondary battery to keep this uh, going if and when I need it. And here is the output for the chuck. I've got an Indiflate, but I've also got an ARB hose with a gauge on it as well. But running into problems requires you to fix the flat. And I would highly recommend you look at different YouTube videos to show you how to go down the process of fixing a flat. Get plenty of the plugs, and this could help you get off the trail or be stranded for a period of time. So tire repair kit, and a means of being able to pump up your tires once you've repaired it is a must-have overlanding piece of gear. So I hope this has been of use to you. Please like the video if you like the video. Subscribe to the content. More L322 overlanding review content coming up soon. I'm in Spain. You'll begin to see more adventure trips videos popping up over the coming weeks. And with that, I'll see you on the next one.